dealing with Iran, will you keep the military option on the table? Of course. You have to keep every option on the table. Obviously, that's not the preferred option. And we remember that Iran responded to sanctions. So financial pressure works. That's why I would make it very difficult for them to move money around the global financial system. But of course, you have to keep that option on the table. By the way, we should have known from the outset that China and Russia were not on our side of the negotiating table. Because China and Russia have always had a vested interest in opening Iran's economy. It is in their interest to do so. So they weren't helping us. We have to have, let's be honest, we have to have the strongest military on the face of the planet, and everybody has to know it. And talk about lack of prioritization. How is it that for 25 years we have failed to serve the veterans who have served us? You know what I would do? I'd take 10 veterans, I would put them in a room, and I would ask them, how do you want to be served? And they would give us a better blueprint than every bureaucrat in the VA can do. And talk about the importance of prioritization. You talk about the military option. I advise two secretaries of defense, and in the Department of Defense, there's something called the tooth to tail ratio. Tooth, fighting men and women, weapons, materiel, tip of the spear, tail, bureaucracy. And guess what? The tooth to tail ratios of the Department of defense right now are as bad as they have ever been. President Obama just announces that he is laying off 40,000 soldiers. Can you believe that? It isn't that we don't have enough money, it's that we never prioritize how to spend our money. So we got to invest in the tooth and we got to reform the tooth. Well, I own a small company and I'm getting crushed with health care Yes, absolutely. You're getting crushed with health care costs, that's right. Obamacare, whatever people thought about it when it was first passed, here are the facts now. Emergency room visits are up over 50%. Health insurance premiums are up 35% on average. We're throwing more and more patients into Medicaid and Medi-Cal, one of those black flies, those famous black flies. We're throwing more and more patients into Medicaid and Medicare, and guess what? Doctors, fewer and fewer doctors are accepting them. And, oh, by the way, it's an unbelievable burden on a business like yours. So businesses are trying not to grow past 50 employees. What a reverse incentive. In other words, this thing is a failure. It is not serving people. Here's what I would do. First, I would repeal Obamacare. Why? We can't tinker. Why? Because it's probably 80,000 pages of legislation and regulation at this point. In other words, literally nobody understands it. Nobody read it. Why do you think you saw a big merger between Aetna and Humana? Because guess what? They are bulking up to deal with this big complicated law. The health insurance companies help write this law. The drug companies help write this law. They want to know the, what the rules are but they're getting bigger and bigger. So you're going to continue to see current course and speed if we don't repeal it. More health insurance mergers, more drug company mergers, more hospital mergers. And that does not serve people. So here's what I would do. I would repeal it. Next, I would give states the responsibility to manage high-risk pools. New Hampshire did pretty well managing a high-risk pool. People do need help. There are people who truly need help. But put the responsibility for providing that help in the states where you are closest to those people. And the last thing I would do is try the one thing in health insurance we have never tried. What we never tried? The free market. Health insurance has been a regulated, cozy little game between regulators and insurance companies for 100 years. We used to do it at a 50 state level. So here in New Hampshire, or California, or Virginia, regulators and insurance companies would get together, write the rules, and there would only be three or four companies that would get to compete. and. You know, you competed up to a point. That's called a regulated oligopoly. It's pretty good business if you can get it. And you know what we did with Obamacare? We just nationalized it. So now we have one gigantic regulated oligopoly. The one thing we've never tried is actual competition. Like we have an auto insurance. What's the other kind of insurance? So let's actually ask the health insurance company, you know what? You've got to compete for your business. Anybody can, can compete for your business. And you can decide who gives you the best value at the best price. Uh, given how important technology is to just driving innovation in new companies, 
Um, as president, what would you do to really just fight the FCC's decision to re reclassify the internet and the whole net neutrality stuff? I'm so glad you asked that question because there are a lot of. It's amazing how many people don't know that even happened. You know, it just happened. The FCC passes 400 along party lines, three to two, three people, whatever you think of them, three people, unelected, unaccountable. Most people don't knew, know who they are. Three people decide to throw over the internet 400 pages of new regulation. Why? Because a bunch of big companies who've done pretty well started to talk to the FCC about, we've got to get the rules straight here. Net neutrality, it always sounded good. So who, who was in there talking about these rules? Verizon, AT&T, Google. This is a terrible thing. Has, this also has to be repealed. Government has no business regulating the Internet. Technology moves far faster than a bureaucrat can even think about it. So we're going to depress the Internet. Unless we start doing it. Yes, yes. So when you win, when you win the nomination, only you with your help. help. Only with your help. How Take nothing you, for granted. How do you compete in New York and California, and how do you neutralize the built-in advantage Democrats have in the class? Everything you just talked about, you would be called all uh, Well, well um, so the question was, how do you complete, compete in places like New York and California, and how, you, how do you combat the press that will call me all kinds of names? So let me start with the second question. One of the things that I have done since I became a candidate is talk to anybody. Talk to everybody. Give every interview. Answer every question. And you know what I found? Yes, people have their biases, without a doubt. But actually, people in the media appreciate it when you answer a question, too. Politics on both sides, but of course Hillary Clinton raises avoiding questions to a fine art, but she ropes the media in. Apparently Bill Clinton did that too. Did you know that? Yeah, um, interesting. Politics has become this sort of formulaic game where nobody really ever answers. I can't tell you how many people come up to me and say, thank you for answering my question. Thank you for being straightforward. Think about what a low bar that is. We've become so used to professional politicians that we find it remarkable when somebody answers a question. Boy, I think we can do better than that. Let's get back to a citizen government by, for, and of the people. Citizens, step forward and run for office. Yes, including the presidency of the United States. So I think it helps to answer their questions. You know, I went on The View, a couple of you noted, um, commented that, and I went on The View. You know, I like Whoopi Goldberg's movies. I don't agree with her. I don't mind disagreeing with her on The View, but I like her. I think they kind of like me. I think it's why Rosie Perez asks halfway through the show with that tone, well, why are you a conservative? And, and I think the tone meant, honestly, you know, I really like you. I mean, why can you, how are you a conservative? And so I do think some of what we have to do is explain, explain why we are, why we believe what we believe. So you know what I said to her? I said, because I believe no one of us is any better than any other one of us. Every one of us has God-given gifts. Every one of us can live a life of dignity and purpose and meaning. And I think our policies work better to lift people up. What I didn't say, but what I believe. And the fight I think we have to have in 2016 as well is that progressives don't believe that. They believe some are smarter than others. Some are better than others. Some actually can't live lives of dignity and purpose. Don't worry, we're going to take care of you. And I find that the height of disrespect and disregard. We're not going to win in California and New York. Let's be honest. I mean, I tried that once, right? <laughs> But here's the interesting thing about my run in California. Of course, I lost that general election. But I won more Republican votes, more Democrat votes, and more independent votes than virtually anyone running anywhere in the nation in 2010. That's how big California is. And you know what? I did it as a conservative. Which goes to show that Democrats and independents can join us as well. 
because a lot of what I'm talking about today actually everybody agrees with. It's why 82% of the American people think we have a professional political class. What does that tell you? It crosses party lines, gender lines, generational lines, race lines. 80% of the people say, you know what? We're sick of politics. And we're sick of the political class because nothing's getting better. Yes. Um, I'm wondering um, what your thoughts are about the new trade policy that um, that uh, Obama is pushing for the Pacific PTA. I'm not sure what it is. But why, why is it that in, in this situation, after all that's happened over the last six years, that uh, his legislation is supported by Boehner and McConnell? And the Democrats are uh, rebelling against it. And do you think it's a, it's a worthy endeavor we should be doing? Beats the heck out of me. But my guess is, with all due respect to Boehner and McConnell, they're getting a lot of pressure from a lot of companies who think they have something to gain in that agreement. Here's what I have said publicly for weeks and weeks and weeks. Look, I'm for free and fair trade, but I also know that partners can violate trade agreements. I remember when China joined the World Trade Organization, they made a lot of deals about things they were going to do, and they haven't lived up to very many of them. They have a strategy to steal our intellectual property they committed not to. So a deal is only as good as people's willingness to adhere to the deal. And so what I have said publicly all along is, Mr. President, if you want this thing passed, tell us what's in it. Really? You have to go into a private reading room to read the deal? You can't talk to anybody about what's in the deal? I think we have enough experience now with a president who talks about us in lofty terms. And then the devil's in the details. And the details match the lofty goals. We've seen that in Obamacare. We've seen it in Dodd-Frank. We've certainly seen it in these Iran negotiations. And I suspect in a 12-party negotiation that has been going on in secret for 18 months, there are a few details in that deal we don't like. So let's see the deal. Yes, ma'am. What would you do about the illegal immigrant problem, the border, and the sanctuary cities? So illegal, illegal immigration, border, sanctuary cities. So here's an example, I think of a problem that gets talked about regularly, and yet the professional political class hasn't done anything about it. Sanctuary cities have been a problem for at least 12 years. There are now 300 plus sanctuary cities in this country where we've just sort of said, hey, you know, you don't have to follow the federal immigration laws. Yeah, people are talking about it now during election cycle, but where have people been? This is not hard, go enforce the law. How long have we been talking about border security? 25 years? And yet it doesn't get secured. Of course we have to secure the border. I would secure the border, not by building a wall and having Mexico pay for it. I don't really think that's realistic. I don't even think it's necessary. But it does take money, manpower, technology, but mostly it appears it takes willpower and leadership to actually do it, not to talk about it, to do it. Secondly, how long has our legal immigration system been an issue? 25 years, at least. We have 16 different visa programs. We don't have an employer verification system that works well enough that we can actually hold employers accountable and say, use it, and if you knowingly hire an illegal, we're going to prosecute you. Wow, we can do this. We send the wrong people home. We let the wrong people in. We hand out tens of thousands of border crossing cards, let people wander across the border, and they just never go back. We don't know when people come and when people leave, so half the people who are here illegally came on a legal visa and just stayed. These are all problems that have festered for 25 years. So let's get our house in order and fix those problems. Let's put a priority on it. And finally, we're going to have to decide what to do with the people who have come here illegally and stayed here illegally. My own view is they do not earn a path to citizenship because I know too many people, Hispanics as well, who've done it the right way, who've taken the oath, who've learned our history, 
who stood up and proudly said, I accept the privilege and the responsibility of citizenship. By the way, I do think we should get to a point where every single American has to be able to pass that same test. <laughs> Maybe they get to earn some kind of legal status. Maybe their children get to earn a path to citizenship at some point. But I think while we are a compassionate nation, I think we are also a fair-minded nation. And it's not fair to say, you folks played by the rules, worked hard, and others didn't, and there's no difference, no conflict. Yes. I have a question about the energy policy. That was my question. I'm sorry. So I've just seen from a little bit of the experience that I've had this summer that the federal government has a very strong arm in every arena of energy politics and policy in the country. Um, and while there is kind of growing consensus to um, you know, adapt to climate change and reducing greenhouse gases, et cetera, while also trying to secure the nation's energy future, how do you think you can mitigate both those challenges and balance them to find the solution? Well, it's a great question. This will be the last question. but. Here is an example of government crushing the potential of this nation. We can be, we should be, we will be, under President Fiorina, the global energy powerhouse of the 21st century. We will be. We can be. What's holding us back? Ourselves. What's holding us back? You know, 18 months of EPA regulation put on all these industries. The EPA is determined to drive the coal industry out of business. Now, here's the truth about this. All the scientists that tell us that global warming climate change is real and caused by man, all of those same scientists tell us this. A single nation acting alone can make no difference at all. Of course, people don't want you to know that. Because if you knew that, you might conclude that all these regulations, all of this push to destroy coal, all of this refusal to tell you the whole story about wind, yes, it's great, but it's slicing up millions of birds every year. Solar's great, but it takes lots of water. No, they don't want to tell you coal is bad, wind is good. It turns out that's about ideology. It's not about science. And I have seen from the state of California ideologues in the environmental movement destroy industry after industry after industry. But not only that, we're shooting ourselves in the head and the foot, because guess what? While we are shutting down coal, while we are preventing us from exporting energy, by the way, why should we export energy? Why should we be the global energy powerhouse? Because it creates jobs, because it gives us a vibrant economic base from which to innovate, which in the end is going to be the answer to climate change, not regulation, innovation but also because it helps us hold bad actors accountable. How did Vladimir Putin get his power? Selling energy. How did Hugo Chavez get his power? Selling energy. How do our Arab allies and some not our allies get their power? Selling energy. How does ISIS get their money? Selling energy. So in other words, if we sell more, they have less leverage. So for all these reasons, we need to do it. And because in the end, we can solve these problems, but we're going to have to innovate. While we're trying to shut the coal industry down, what is China doing? China is burning coal like crazy. Not only that, they're investing in the innovation around clean coal technology. So one of these days, they're going to be a leader. And of course, some people on the left don't want you to know that half the energy, half the electricity, almost half the electricity in this nation comes from coal. So when Hillary Clinton shuts down coal, who gets hurt with energy prices? The middle class. If we want to grow our economy, we have to have inexpensive and reliable energy for all these reasons. We have to recognize, yes, we have to be responsible stewards of our planet. Yes, we must conserve our natural resources. But we should do it through innovation, not ideologically driven regulation, which is doing no good at all for the environment and crushing the potential of this nation. Ladies and gentlemen, I really appreciate you being here. I need your help. I need your help. I know it takes you New Hampshireites a long time to make up your minds, and I respect that. But you know what? You do believe in citizen government. And as a citizen who is running for office, I don't have years of email lists or years of donor lists. I got to do this 
from a standing start. I got to build it day after day after day. And so I appreciate so much you coming here tonight. I appreciate you leaving here tonight and talking to your friends and your neighbors and your colleagues, those you work and worship with, and just say something as simple as, you know, you ought to pay attention to her. I appreciate your willingness to provide us with fuel, because you know campaigns need fuel. Help us get this word out. Help us knock on doors. I can win this job, and I can do this job. And together, we can unlock the potential of this great nation. Thank you so very much, ladies and gentlemen. Crop TV.